Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Today, today is Friday, August 28th, 2020, and the Oklahoma Federation of Democratic Women's Clubs is pleased to present an installment of our commemorative video series honoring the 19th Amendment centennial anniversary. Our video series is entitled, My Centennial Crush, My Suffragist Shiro. Throughout the month of August, we have recognized and honored the women whose blood, sweat, and tears secured the right to the vote for women and also those who have continued to move women forward in our quest towards full equality. Our program today will highlight the centennial crush of another very important Oklahoma Democratic woman, Senator Kay Floyd, who represents the Oklahoma City Senate District 46 and is the Democratic leader of the Oklahoma State Senate. Originally from Ada, Senator Floyd graduated from OSU in 1980 Afterwards, she attended OU and received her Juris Doctor degree. After two years in private practice, Senator Floyd became an Assistant Attorney General for the state of Oklahoma. In 1987, she accepted the position of Deputy Executive Director of the Oklahoma Horse Racing Commission. During that time, she was also a member of the Board of Education for the Oklahoma City Public School District 89. In 1989, Senator Floyd was appointed as an administrative law judge and served in that capacity for 22 years. Her appointment made her one of the youngest women in the Oklahoma history to receive a judicial appointment. During that time, she also served as a special municipal court judge for the city of Oklahoma City. Sounds like she just likes to stay busy to me. Along with her judicial duties, Senator Floyd has been an adjunct professor and, her, and has volunteered her time and talents, assisting many nonprofit and charitable organizations. She was also a founding member of the Justice Alma Wilson Seaworth Academy, which was established in 1998 and served at-risk youth in the Oklahoma City community. She was elected into the Oklahoma House of Representatives in 2012, and two years later, she went into the Oklahoma Senate, where she focuses on improving our education system and working for Oklahoma's women and children. She has authored bills to provide, to provide suicide prevention training in Oklahoma City school and Oklahoma schools and required potential guardians to undergo background checks. In 2014, Senator Floyd authored the Lethality Assessment Act, which made Oklahoma the first in the nation to establish a program focusing on intimate partner violence. In 2019, she authored legislation to address Oklahoma's backlog of untested rape kits through standardizing the guidelines for testing rape kits and creating a statewide tracking system for collecting sexual assault evidence. The legislation also expands continued education for law enforcement on how to properly address sexual assault reports. Senator Floyd is the recipient of numerous honors and accolades, all of which are well-deserved. In 2014, she was one of five women lawyers presented with the 2014 Spotlight Award by the Oklahoma Bar Association. The Spotlight Awards were created in 1996 and given annually to five women who have distinguished themselves in the legal profession and lighted the way for other women. 
It was renamed in 1998 to honor the late <laughs> Mona Salyer Lambert, the first woman president of the OBA and one of the first recipients. In 2016, Senator Floyd was the honored recipient of the Oklahoma Higher Education Distinguished Service Award for her continued support of higher education, including the Oklahoma's Promise Scholarship Program. Her strong stance against weapons on campus and her support of funding for higher education. Also, in 2016, the National Foundation for Women Legislators named Senator Floyd as an elected Women of Excellence Award winner. The award was established in 2013 as part of NFWL's 75th anniversary celebration in order to honor the hard work and dedication of women leaders from across the country there is nothing better than being recognized by your peers for your work. The following year, she was honored by the, for, by the Oklahoma, why can I get this right? Because this is my organization. She, she was honored by the Oklahoma Commission on the Status as Women with the prestigious Guardian Award. The Guardian Award was established in 2012 to recognize elected officials who have made significant contributions to guarding, protecting, and preserving the rights of women and families. In 19, 2019, the Oklahoma Women's Coalition honored Senator Floyd as a 2019 Courage Award recipient. The Courage Award is dedicated to brave policy champions who work tirelessly to improve equity and restore hope for Oklahoma women. As I reviewed your life accomplishments in preparation for today, I was reminded of former Secretary of State Madeleine Albright's infamous quote, there's a special place in hell for women who don't help other women. <laughs> you have without a doubt dedicated your life to helping other women. And for that, Senator Floyd, we are eternally grateful. Although the 19th Amendment was ratified in 1920, this landmark event was neither the beginning nor the end of the story for women and their struggle for the right to vote. We are thankful, Senator Floyd, that you are standing shoulder to shoulder with us on the voting rights battlefield. We are certain that you will continue to lead us, encourage us, and energize us in our journey towards full equality. You are truly one of our OFDWC suffragist sheroes, and we are excited to hear which suffragist is your centennial crush. Madam President, thank you so very, very much for that introduction. And I'm so appreciative of the Oklahoma Federation of Democratic Women and all that you all do. Um, one, one small little correction. The uh, Kay Floyd, who sat on the Oklahoma City School Board, is, uh, is a Kay Floyd good friend of mine who lives in Edmond, Oklahoma. So uh, she and I trade jokes about the fact that we have the same name and work in the same areas and live in the same cities. So. Anyway, just that, that short little correction, but I truly appreciate all of your kind words. Um, just a little little personal note here. I, uh, I remember just after I was first elected that uh, I gave one of my first speeches at a dinner that was hosted by uh, the Oklahoma Federation of Democratic Women. And um, it's interesting because a lot of that speech I gave seven years ago discussed the uh, how Oklahoma could not afford to systematically eliminate the voices of people of color and people because of their age or people that were women. And so it's interesting to me that we are still having to have those conversations today in the state. So thank you all for everything that you do and, and all the support that you give to women and to especially those of us that are women elected officials. So I am very pleased and, and grateful that you've asked me to uh, talk to you about my current 
uh, centennial crush. Uh, the women's suffrage movement is such an amazing part of American history, and it's always hard to, to choose someone who stands out. But uh, one of my favorites is one that you all may not have heard of, or you're, and it uh, is Elizabeth Cady Stanton. And Elizabeth was one of probably two women who were instrumental in actually starting an organized women's suffrage movement. And she was born in 1815 in New York. Uh, her father was a prominent attorney, and he later became a congressman and a judge. And people have said that a lot of Elizabeth's intellect and writing abilities and oratory abilities probably came from her experience and her uh, training with her father. He also was a slave owner, which many believe is the reason that Elizabeth was such a strong abolitionist. She, let's fast forward to 1840. Uh, 1840, she was married. She was on her honeymoon in London and with her husband, and they were going to attend an anti-slave convention, which I guess in the 1840s is what women suffragists did on their honeymoons. <laughs> so she and her husband attended the anti-slave convention, and at that place, at that gathering, that convention, Elizabeth met a woman by the name of Lucretia Mote. And they were both supposed to be delegates at this convention. When they got there, they were told that their husbands would be allowed on the floor of the convention and their husbands would be allowed to vote. However, Elizabeth and Lucretia were going to have to sit up in the balcony. They were not going to have a voice and they were not going to have a vote. So I think we're seeing the beginning of a pattern for things that Elizabeth Caden Stanton was not going to tolerate. After the convention, she and Lucretia decided that when they returned to the States that they were going to take action. But it wasn't until 1848 when Elizabeth and Lucretia and three other women organized what would become known as the Seneca Falls Convention. And at this convention, Elizabeth played a very, very big part uh, of how the convention was, was run and the issues that were going to be presented at the convention. Originally, women wanted to do, accomplish two things. They wanted to accomplish being able to, to own property because they couldn't at that time. And they wanted to be able to get a higher education, which they were not allowed to do at that time. So at the convention, the discussion revolved around how could women get those two rights. And the decision was that the best way for women to be able to control their futures, to be able to, to have the same rights as men, was to be able to elect people who would represent them. So that's how the women's right to vote movement got its legs. At the convention, Elizabeth presented two main documents, and these documents would guide the suffrage movement for the next 70 years. The first one was the Declaration of Sentiments, and the second was the Resolutions. And as a side note, I would let you all know that something I've learned when I was doing my research was that Elizabeth Stanton is said to have later used her extensive research abilities, and she evidently had stirring writing talents, and that's a quote, to craft women's rights literature. And she also did uh, drafts of and helped uh, Susan B. Anthony with a lot of her speeches. So as we know from that date in 1948, and for the next 70 years until the 19th Amendment was ratified, in 1920, we had three generations of women who were fighting to ensure that all women in America were gonna have the right to vote. So I was thinking about this the other day. If we were standing on the steps of the United States Capitol today, and it was 1920, then we'd be surrounded by our great grandmothers and our grandmothers and our mothers, all of whom had spent their lifetimes three generations getting us the right to vote. I just, I just find that amazing. Let me, let me end by saying this. Elizabeth Stanton was not still with us on August 18th in 1920 um, when the 19th Amendment passed. She had passed away uh, 18 years earlier in October of 1902, but 
rather than be sad by that fact, I, I read something in an article the other day about her death, which made me smile. Um, the article said that when she died, and this is a quote, true to form, she wanted her brain to be donated to science upon her death to debunk claims that the mass of men's brains made them smarter than women, close quote. I don't know if that story is true or not, but based on everything that I've read about Elizabeth Cady Stanton, I'll bet it is true. Madam President, that's, that's my centennial crush story. And thank you so much for having me. I, I have been delighted. This has been a wonderful experience for me. Well, thank you so much. I, I was uh, reminiscent of something that happened a few years ago, and I'm, I'm not sure if you remember uh, if you were even in Oklahoma City at the time, but when we had the march at the Capitol, at the Oklahoma State Capitol for the, to get the ERA ratified or the, here in our, you know, to pass here in Oklahoma, I was standing shoulder to shoulder with my mother. And the first person to call me when I got home was my grandmother in Ada calling to tell me that she saw us on the news and how pleased and how honored and how proud of us she was. And so what you shared with us is exactly right that, you know, with these as we struggle, we are doing this in the name of our ancestors, along with our children, our grandmothers, and our great-grandmothers. I will say that I was really pleased when they unveiled the uh, statue in uh, Central Park on August 26. It was, uh, of course, uh, Sojourner Truth, Susan B. Anthony, and Elizabeth Cady, Cady Stanton. And those were, in my opinion, the big three. You know, when we talk about the civil rights movement, we talk about the big six, the men that were the big six. When we talk about women's suffrage, these three ladies are indeed the big three. So again, Senator, we are so pleased that you were able to share with us uh, and uh, we look forward to working with you in the future. Uh, you have always been a friend and champion of the Oklahoma Federation of Democratic Women. And we know that you will continue to be standing with us. And we want to commend you for your stance during this legislative session on doing everything that you can to protect the citizens of Oklahoma from this dreaded COVID virus. And we would also like to see if you have any closing words about voting and in this coming up uh, season that we're in right now. Thank you, Madam President. Yes, uh, th thank you for those kind words. And, and again, thank you for everything that you all have done. The, the Federation has been such a support to all of us and my colleagues, my female colleagues especially, we visit often about how much support we feel and how active you all in the Oklahoma Federation of Democratic Women have been and how, how grateful we are. We don't, we don't feel like we're alone when we're up at the Capitol, so thank you. Um, I would definitely like to encourage everyone to vote absentee ballot. The reason I say that is is twofold. First of all, obviously, we are still in the midst and the grips of a, of a pandemic virus. It is um, very, very dangerous. It is very contagious. And no matter how many precautions we take, we know that the larger group of people that congregate, the more likely the odds are of, of people becoming ill. Um, there's been a lot of media about absentee ballot. I think, um, I don't know if I've ever been as proud of us as a nation the last three to four to five weeks as people have stood up and said, no, you are not going to tell me I have to choose between my health and my right to vote. You are not going to close down the post offices. You are not going to slow down this process. And you are not going to tell us that uh, removal of machinery and removal of post office boxes is just a coincidence. 
So I have been very grateful that the American public has stood up and, and the Postal Service leadership uh, have backed up and backed off of their actions, which were clearly going to obstruct the voting process in the, in the United States. Um, I encourage people to use absentee ballots because I think it's safer, but also it is going to be a lot of, of voting going on. And if you send in an absentee ballot, then it's easier for people. And we've made it easier for people with the COVID, uh, COVID virus. The last thing, one of the last bills we passed, bipartisan bill, was to allow for uh, a relaxation on the notary requirement on the absentee ballots. So request your ballot early. You have to request a ballot. You can go to the website for the election board. You can go to Oklahoma Voter Portal. And you can request your absentee ballot online. That takes out one step right there. That removes one step. And they can process that at the election board. And then they send you your application, which you fill out and you send back and you can get an absentee ballot that way. So it's a two-step process. It can be easier if you do it online. And the faster you do it, the faster you get the absentee ballots once they're printed. And then if, if you the day you get it, we suggest everyone's just, just the day you get it, fill it out and put it back in the mail. Get, get your notary or get your copy of your identification, whatever's needed for the absentee ballot at that point, and just do it right then and put it back in the mail. And that way we don't have to be concerned about the massive amounts of absentee ballots that are going to be coming in. And we don't have to be concerned about your ballot being received and most importantly, your ballot being counted. Well, thank you so much for those closing words. Again, thank you for sharing your centennial crush with us. Uh, be safe. Thank you, Madam President. You too.